judgment. And sometimes looking back on God's back on the past gives us hope to enter the future. So I've been trying to understand the, um, the protesters. I know they're not monolithic, but they're a little bit monolithic. Um, and what they want, and the past I've turned back to all week long, was the 60s. Uh, as a child of the 70s, the 70s really were the 60s. The 60s only really started at the end of the 60s. So I count myself having experienced, um, interestingly enough for me, my earliest memory was really of the Munich Olympics. And I think today that would be celebrated by the protesters um, watching TV and then watch, I guess they call this brainwashing, um, watching uh, TV movies and documentaries and watching it unfold on television still really is part of the 60s. So I try to reach back to the joy, to the 60s protest movements. You know, like there must be something I is now a gray haired person. As one person um, said at the city council meeting I attended as she looked at me, um, uh, she said, uh, actually, the people were looking at me as she was saying this. Um, th the real enemy is really not Israel. The greater enemy is uh, middle haired white men who call themselves liberals. So now that I'm a middle a middle aged white um, gray haired man liberal, I try to look back on the 60s and say, is there something I could connect with from my roots that helps me understand the goodness that's inherent in what the protests? And this article, I'm going to read a little bit to you. I'm trying to get in their minds since I don't know them. You probably know them better. This comes from the author, the writer, Olivia Reingold, who went to Columbia's um, encampment and talked to some of the protesters, spent, I think, a day there. She writes, it's a Monday afternoon at Columbia University, but hundreds of students are not in class. I think it's very interesting, the sense of entitlement that they expect to be uh, like they expect this to be automatically forgiven so that us middle, you know, middle-aged um, white people understand that they're doing the good of the world and so they don't have to turn in their assignments. Um, hundreds of students are not in class. They're camped out on a lawn in front of the main library, making friendship bracelets, painting scraps of cardboard with slogans, and gossiping about the Zionists on campus. A few steps away in front of a sign that says, paint your nails for Palestine, a girl is fanning her freshly polished red toenails. Nearby, a student with purple hair in the style of Farrah Fawcett is frantically going from student to student, asking if they've seen her vape. When she finds it buried under a copy of France Fanon's black skin, white masks and a hoodie, she gasps and clutches it to her heart. No one is paying much attention to a nearby woman with a microphone who is desperately trying to rally the crowd. This is the Gaza Solidarity Encampment, sprawling tent city with a first aid center, a counseling tent, a people's library for liberated learning, a writing center, an art corner, a media corner, and a laundry area for drying clothes when it rains. A student named Ariella, whose entire face is wrapped in a red kafia, except for two bright green eyes, tells me there is space for everyone at the camp. Everyone has a role in the revolution, they tell me. They go by they, them. And so there's a space for people like me. My thing is I like to organize things. So I spend my time here in this tent and I organize the supplies, the melatonin gummies, the gluten-free bread, the organic tampons, the Avino sunscreen, the charging banks, the board games, and the pins that say Union Proud. Ariella tells me, they are 22. Today, I've been mostly tidying our Passover inventory. I grew up very religious, and so I know the most minute details of what a religious person would need. Ariella was raised by modern Orthodox parents, and they tell me that they went to a Jewish day school where they sang, hat sang Hatikva every morning. They began having doubts about the way they were raised at age 12 when they realized they were queer. It made me question things that I had been told were true, they said. If my community didn't know how to embrace me as a queer person, what were the other things that they were not embracing? At Columbia, experiencing conversations with others, she called they called them patient conversations, and reading that they were asked to do, they are one of the hundreds of students camping out on the South Lawn. They are camping out in order to stand up to, quote, the violent Zionist settler entity, unquote, of Israel as a student leader told reporters at a Tuesday press conference. Genocide is a word that goes thrown around incessantly among the college students. There's infinite anger toward Israel. There is no anger toward Hamas. 
even though it's the terrorist group that murdered 1,200 people on October 7th, still holds approximately 129 hostages. There's no mention of the half a million Syrians murdered by the country's president, Bashar al-Assad. There's not a single person, not a single sign expressing outrage over the workers in China who are facing an actual genocide and forced labor simply because they're Muslim. And it does not occur to these young people, supposedly our best and brightest in our nation, that the leaders of Hamas are using them. As Hamas leader Khaled Mashal said in January on Arab TV, the slogan of the American students will be from Pal Palestine is free from the river to the sea. At the protest at NYU, we watched as one activist carried a generator stamped with the world, words People's Forum, a New York City-based organization funded by a multimillionaire Marxist with ties to the Chinese government. Here, I am told, outside agitators uh, need to be welcomed into the encampment. Nurdin Kiswani showed up to the encampment, leading dozens of Columbia students in chants of, there is only one solution, Intifada revolution. A retired law enforcement official who has helped advise the federal government on national security told me that groups egging on this movement root themselves by and large on college campuses because their greatest and most impressionable audience is the students. And their organizing powers can be seen in the encampments, which have matching tents, identical chants, and shared tactics and guidelines regardless of the university across the US. You can see the uniformity and sophistication and the appearance of the protest, he added. There's an organizational character to it that we are witnessing. Though I've been told everyone is invited to the revolution, it's not entirely true. On Sunday night, when there were quote unquote Zionists who have entered the camp, James, the spokesman for the group, directed his fellow protesters to link arms and push them out. We are going to create a human chain where I'm standing, he shouted to participants, and they repeated it back in unison over and over so that they do not pass this point and infringe upon our privacy and try to disrupt our community. On Tuesday afternoon, Isidore Carton, a 23-year-old recent Columbia grad, walked into the camp holding an Israeli flag, hoping he might be able to change some of the protesters' minds simply through holding conversation. Conversation did start, and he started talking to them but then a safety trained volunteer in a yellow vest quickly intervened. Whenever we start to get common ground, the organizers will come over and say, no, you can't talk to them. Says Carton, who tells me Hamas murdered his uncle in 1996. As it, it's as if they can't have their own opinion and they have to blindly follow. A reporter from Japan crouches down to speak with us. So I'm curious, why is there nobody condemning Hamas, he says, squinting to keep the sun out of his eyes, it needs to be said, right? Another student pipes up, it has been said. No, it hasn't been said, the reporter says, shaking his head. The student stops speaking, then look down at the mat. And after a few seconds, the reporter gets up and thanks them for their time. Once he's gone, one of the students rushes to go talk to someone about it. That was weird, she says, as she brushes dirt off her jeans. The organizers need to know about him. So we see that these, or these protests <clears throat> are professionally organized. They're imbued with TikTok ideology dispensed by the Chinese government. And they're funded with, through Chinese, Russian, and other entities. They have matching tents, they have generators, they have paid organizers, some on fellowships, paid fellowships to get paid $1,000 a month to go and work eight hours a day, and generators, and they've got their talking points. While I would understand and possibly support protests that call for humanitarian aid to Gaza, perhaps signs that call for a two-state solution, that is not what they are asking for. The banners are for intifada, the wholesale murder of Jews, and an ethnic cleansing of Jews from the river to the sea. The ideology is a highly simplified anarchist Marxism. The only truth in the world is whether one has an identity of oppressor or oppressed, and Jews represent the oppressor. And this indicates a system that is sick at its core and needs to be blown up, our system, the world system, the liberal system, as if there could be a system without it. So it's full of nihilism. Murder, rape, all are tools of the revolution. It's almost apocalyptic in its outlook, the only ones who will be saved in the end times 
by some holy entity or those with oppressed identities. Hamas's ideology, as you know, actually has Israel as the little Satan and the United States as the big Satan. So as I was desperately trying to connect this week with six, the 60s protests and see good in these entitled folk who are calling for the rape and murder of our people and not for what I would hope that they would be calling for, something I could support, I noticed three differences between this student movement and the student movement of the 60s. The 60s protesters weren't rooting for the Viet Cong. They weren't celebrating violence against US soldiers. They weren't hoping for a foreign takeover of all of Asia. Number two, the 60s protesters weren't professional paid propagandists organized and funded by foreign governments and reading social media organized and dispensed by foreign governments. And number three, the 60s protesters had a romantic vision of love, of nature, and of inclusion. What protesters today have is a nihilistic vision of structures crumbling with no idea of what would replace it. In the 60s, they were saying, replace guns with flowers. Now they seem to be saying, replace one side's guns with more guns. That quasi-utopian vision strikes me less as one of love and inclusion and one closer to a promised fascism, which uses the victims. And so as I try to draw some strength from the Haggadah, from the experience of this week, even though it's not an up week for me, one lesson I have learned, we've all learned, is Jewish resilience. The Haggadah states that we are still here. And the Shana Haba Birushalayim, we made it come true. And we will keep it true. Shabbat Shalom.